Good morning. How are we doing today? This is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit, and welcome back to another video. And this is going to be part three of hand reading in Six Max. And if you haven't already seen part one and part two, please pause this first and go watch those first. It's going to make a lot more sense once you understand the preflop range that we assigned, the flop range that we assigned. That's going to set us up for making really good range decisions on the turn, and then of course help us make even better decisions on the river. And I'll give you a hint: the river is not so pretty. So it's really important that we have those previous ranges really, really hammered out and really, really correct, or at least as correct as we can possibly make them. So just to make sure we are all on the same page and a quick review of the hand. Again, hand 27, cutoff opens for a buck 50. We decide a three bet with pocket kings. They call, we dissected that range. We continuation bet an eight, six, four rainbow flop for about half pot. The cutoff calls, again, not too, too shocking given what we've seen from this player in terms of HUD stats. They are a 34, 13 over a 109 sample size. They call the flop. And here we are on the turn. And again, we decide to bet this time for a little over half pot and the cutoff calls again. So we're going to start by focusing on, okay, what did the cutoff call our double barrel with and what does that range look like and how can we use that to not only figure out if the turn line was awesome, but to set us up for making really good river decisions as well. So let's start by adding the turn card to Flopzilla. And up here we have the template ready to rock and roll for this hand. And just for the record, if you want to download your own, either to follow along with this or just to use in your own hand reading off table analysis, you can do so at splitsuit.com slash templates. That will redirect you right to the page. It is a name your own price product. And yes, $0 totally works. So they are free if you want them to be free. So with all that said, we bet 13, they call awesome. So the guiding stuff we have here is this, the cutoff continues calling. Do you think the cutoff would raise by now if they had a huge hand? Would the cutoff call again with ace high, over pairs, pocket sixes, that sort of stuff. And again, these guiding questions are here to get your brain started thinking about the kind of hand categories that cutoff could possibly have. And if they did have them, how would they play them? So if they had ace high, what would they continue doing? Over pairs like pocket nines, pocket tens, which again, if you don't really understand why this range looks like this, definitely pause this and watch parts one and two first. Otherwise, this range could be a little confusing and it may not make a lot of sense. So with all that said, let's get started hacking away through this. And you notice that if we just look at the HUD stats real quick, yes, we have one to showdown. We have win money at showdown, 3170 respectively. And the fold verse turn C bet, we haven't seen this, or this person hasn't faced one yet. So we have no stat for that right this moment. And again, not super shocking given the sample size, only 109 hands. And yes, if we remember back from the previous street on the flop, they did fold verse flop C bet 75% of the time. But again, what is that out of? Maybe maybe four, maybe eight samples. So it's not something that's super reliable. They've called C bets a couple of times, again, maybe one, maybe two times. So they haven't even faced a turn C bet yet. So this is really, really important when you are not just looking at hands in real time, but also reviewing hands in your off session stuff. And you're looking at HUD stats, make sure you're always keeping sample size in mind, especially when you're talking about turn and river specific stats. When you're talking about someone who only has maybe 100, 150, hands, maybe even to two or 250. That's not a big enough sample usually to have great information on turn and river specific stats or even like really, really detailed flop stats. So keep that kind of stuff in mind when you're trying to use your HUD to hand read because your HUD is very, very helpful when you're hand reading and you're trying to assign really, really precise and perfect ranges but you really have to keep sample size in mind. Some stats just simply are not going to be very useful when you're talking about really small sample sizes, and 109 kind of fits that bill. Good sample size for VPIP PFR, not so much for things like fold verse turn CBET. So with all that said, we're kind of flying blind here in terms of using HUD stats to our specific advantage here. So we're just going to have to do our absolute best, especially when answering these guiding questions of, do we think the cutoff is going to call again if they have ace high, over pairs, or pocket sixes? So if you remember on the flop, we kind of made the assumption that they were going to play sets kind of aggressively. This is someone who may look at this board and say, well, I don't want to let a five or a seven roll off for free. And they may just be more apt to play sets aggressively on the flop. And again, if you're not sure why we're talking about that, go watch part two first. So by the time it gets to the turn, do I think they're going to call again? And again, this is what we're building. We're building the calling range here. I don't think they're going to call if they have a set here. 
Really, I don't. I think they're going to raise, if they didn't raise the FOP, I think they're definitely going to raise the turn. I just don't see them continuing to call. Remember, bad players will look at this board and start getting a little skittish. They're going to say, oh, well, there are four straights that could show up. There are flush draws that could improve out the back door. When bad players get really panicked, when they have a big hand, they tend to get really, really panicky about draws filling and oftentimes just irrationally so. So keep that in mind. Oftentimes, if they're going to continue calling the flop and turn, typically by that point, I'm kind of taking out really monster hands a large chunk of the time. And of course, they can't have any straights based upon the ranges we assigned earlier, but I'm just going to assume that those, of course, if they had them, they would raise them too because they would raise sets with my assumptions. Two pairs, same concept. Overpairs, are they going to fold an overpair? Are they going to raise an overpair? Are they going to fold an overpair? Well, from this kind of player, I don't think there's any reason to think they're going to fold one. Now, yes, if we look at things like they went to showdown, 31%. So, yeah, you may look at that and say, well, they go to showdown a third of the time. Again, 109 hands, not super reliable. That being said, still don't think there's any reason to think that someone like this is going to fold it. So the real question to me is, at this point, if they did have the overpairs, again, the nines through jacks or the discounted queens plus... I don't think they're going to always raise. I think they're going to raise some percentage of the time, but it's not uncommon for someone like this, if they are going to call the three bet and call the flop C bet, that they just kind of call down and think they are inducing bluffs and go from there. So as far as the overpairs, I'm going to dilute them a little bit. Again, making the assumption that they're going to raise them some percentage of the time. So I'm going to say they're going to call 60, raise 40. I think that's probably pretty fair for someone like this. And again, you are totally, totally okay to disagree or have your own assessments here. Or maybe you're doing this on your own. You're saying, okay, well, I think the cutoff is a little bit different. That's totally fine. Obviously, if you make any changes in who this player is, be it stats, be it uh, different levels, you might think the players play a little bit differently. That's totally fine. Use your best range assessment given the information that you have. And if you have any other information, cool, use that to your advantage. If you've seen showdowns, if you've seen them, play over pairs in certain ways in this spot in the past that is going to massively massively influence the range that you assign right here so i am assuming a 60 percent call through with over pairs 40 percent raise that's why i'm doing this the way that i am and by the way if you've never done this in flopzilla you simply right click it and here you get a chance to wait it go to accept and you're good to go so top pairs uh, I don't think they're going to raise those, honestly, unless they're made with hearts. So if they have, you know, top pair with the hearts, say it's ace eight of hearts, maybe they're more likely to raise it. But I think as a pure default, you're going to see a lot of calls here with top pairs. And pocket pairs below top pair, yeah, I don't think they're going to fold sevens, So, and I don't think they're going to raise it, so definitely continue that. And again, we're putting these little blue marks next to all the hands we think are going to continue by calling specifically. Middle pairs, they don't have them, but sure. Weak pairs, so this is a curious one at this point. If they had pocket fives or pocket threes, what do we think they're going to do? And I don't think they're going to raise right? I think some players are more likely to semi-bluff, sure, but I don't think this is the kind of person who is, nor do I think they're the kind of person who wants to fold a pair plus draw. So yeah, continue that in the calling range. And flush draws, yep, I don't think they're folding those. I don't think they're going to raise them either. This is someone who is pretty darn passive from what we've seen so far. Big gap in the VPIP PFR denotes a lot of passivity, pre-flop specifically, but oftentimes I assume that carries over post-flop as well. Yes, 109 hands, we're not going to have perfect information in terms of like, do they raise a lot of the time or do they have a large check raise percentage? So we could start estimating, do they semi-bluff aggressively? We don't have that info, but I'm still going to just make the assessment flush draws are going to get called a large, large chunk of the time. And then open-ended straight draws. Yeah, I think if they have that, they're definitely going to continue. It's really only with the double gut shot with pocket fives. And now we're left with the other stuff. So the other stuff specifically you notice is what? Ace high, which is, again, we thought that they were going to peel that off a large chunk of the time on the flop. Makes sense. Three bet pot, half pot, C bet. They have position. Yeah, I'd expect a lot of players are going to peel off ace high. But the question at this point is, are they going to continue appealing it? Or at this point, do they say, well, I'm facing multiple streets of pressure. I don't think my ace high is good. The ace high doesn't even have a, a gush out or a draw attached to it. Because again, these do not include like ace 10 of hearts. This only includes like ace 10 off. So I'm assuming at this point that no, I don't think they're going to be calling here with ace high. I think they called the flop with it. They tried to peel it off. They tried to look for a spot where you check the turn. You didn't do that. 
I think they go away a large chunk. So maybe you think they have a size here occasionally. Maybe you say like, I don't know, 10% of the time they're going to have a size. Okay, sure. Maybe we, we add it in there, but it's going to be super slight. You notice that it doesn't really affect the overall equation that much, right? This goes from 40.4 all the way up to 43.8. I mean, who cares? It's not changing things that that much, but you want to be really careful here because obviously if the river is an ace, that's going to massively change things if there are zero combos of it versus some combos of it. So keep that kind of stuff in mind. And gut shots, well, gut shots are going to be made with two over cards or they're going to be made with like sevens or threes. Yeah, I think those are continuing as well. And that's probably about it. So this is the range that I'm assigning when they, again, raise prefob, call a three bet. They call the flop bet and now they're calling the turn bet. So to put this all in the template, control, alt, T is in Timothy. That gives us the full output. Sweet. We're going to put in 46 because that's the percentage of previous range. I'll explain that in one second. And push the tab to go into combo mode and we're down to 121. Perfect. And again, you don't have to be super detailed with the decimals if you don't want to at this point. So what does this 46% mean? This means that they're continuing 46% of the time by calling of the range that they got here with. Now, if we looked at all the hands that could possibly get here, and, oops, sorry, I forgot one quick thing. I forgot to turn this green. That is actually a really, really key thing to do here. So control alt T is in Timothy. Let's get that back in here, paste that in, sorry. So the whole reason why we do this is because this tells Fobzilla, okay, we're only going to look at hands that pass through, that met those criteria that we just set. And that's what's going to influence this turn range. Sorry about the confusion if you got a little confused there. So the big thing that, again, this is talking about is we're making the assessment that of the range that got to the turn, 46% of it is going to continue by calling. And you notice that, you know, if we untick this real quick and go back, like even if we included sets in terms of the always continuing, that's about half. What this really means is that half the time this person is going to continue when you double barrel the turn and about half the time they're going to fold based upon that assessment. And a large chunk of the time when they continue, they're going to do so like we saw here by flatting. So if you see someone, and again, this is that kind of like zoom in and then zoom right back out kind of approach. So we zoomed in, built this range out, built it really precise or as precise as we thought we could. We looked at everything and then we zoom right back out. We say, okay, well, based upon that, what should we do here? What should be the strategic adjustment to that? Well, the strategic adjustment is this. This is someone who's folding half the time. So if they're folding half the time, what would we do if we had a semi bluff? What would we do if we had pocket fives ourselves? What would we do if we were messing around on the flop with ace jack of spades, right? We're looking at someone who's folding about half the time. And this is just simply objective, right? There's no like, I mean, yes, there's some assumptions in terms of what do we think they're going to do with certain parts of their range, but we're really just looking at numbers here, you know? So this is really important whenever you get lost, in a hand. It's oftentimes because you're focused more on your own whole cards than you are in your opponent's range. So this is stuff that you practice off table. The workbook, of course, walks you through these exercises to keep you focused on your opponent's range. But when you're focused on that, it makes it really easy to determine what you should do, whether you have pocket kings like we did in this situation, or if you have pocket fives, ace queen, pocket jacks, whatever it is. So People get themselves in trouble because they don't do this hand reading stuff. They simply look at, I have pocket kings, I have an overpair on this board, I'm going to town. Rather than breaking it down, thinking about how their hand performs against their opponent's range, and then making decisions simply against that. If you ever find someone who's folding half or more than half the time, you can make outright profitable bluffs with lots of different things. Pocket fives, pocket threes, with a six with whatever the heck you want. So yes, you're kind of bluffing a large chunk of the time because you're generating a lot of folds, but is that necessarily a bad thing? And of course, when you are in the value side of the spectrum, like we are here, obviously we see that we are absolutely crushing our opponent's range. We can see that right here in Flopzilla and awesome. It's going to be really, really easy to make decisions. So when that's the case, my question is this again, zooming out again, is a $13 bet the best play? 
Well, I think betting is definitely the best play. I don't think there's any reason to necessarily look for check raising in this kind of situation, unless you think that there's going to be a lot of stabs from this person from a large chunk of their range, which I don't think is the case given their passivity. And if we are deciding to bet, is 13 the best size, right? I think that if we bet here for 16 or 17 bucks, this person still continues with most of these hands. I think, yes, probably those naked ace highs go away some percentage of the time, probably most of the time, even this little few combos that are currently here. But I think flush draws, yeah, those are going to be pretty inelastic. Those are going to pay us off. Those are going to draw incorrectly. Sweet. Make a bigger bet against them. When they have weak pairs, when they have over pairs, when they have top pairs, I think all of those hands continue for a larger size. So again, this is how you zoom out. You use the hand range that you just built, and then you say, wait, wait, wait. Was my actual strategic line best, or could there have been improvements there? And this is how you want to start studying and getting in the habit of studying off table and in between sessions. Because once you study this enough off table, it actually becomes very, very easy in real time before you even decide to bet to say, okay, what do we think that range is going to look like? What density of strong to weak hands is that? How do I perform against that? And based upon all of that, Do I think my bet size influences their range a lot? If yes, okay, what should I do against that? If no, okay, are they inelastic? And if yes, and I'm in the value side of my spectrum, should I go much, much larger? And again, I think 13 is leaving money on the table here. Against this specific opponent with the exact ranges that we assigned, I think 13 leaves money on the table. So again, this is how you start putting it all together. Is this complex? Yeah. Kind of, especially if this is your first time doing it, this is going to be a little bit weird. Is this going to pay off huge in the long run and pay huge dividends for you for doing this kind of work and study? You bet. So this is the stuff that you need to start doing between sessions. If you aren't already doing it, please start. And obviously my workbook sets up all these examples for you, makes your life a million times easier. You can learn more about it at splitsuit.com slash six. But whether you go with the workbook or whether you decide, hey, I'm going to do this on my own, Please, please do this kind of work. Study the ranges, study the frequencies, get an innate feel for these things. And yes, it will become innate. It will become easier to estimate these things in real time. And then it becomes a million times easier to choose the correct, profitable, and hopefully almost optimal line when you're playing in real time. So that's going to wrap it up for this video. Hopefully you enjoyed, hopefully you learned something. And yes, this situation may seem a little mundane and a little boring, right? We're analyzing a double barrel with an overpair on a relatively brick card. It's not the most exciting situation in the world, but this is the kind of spot that probably comes up for you multiple times per session, especially when you're multi-tabling online. So any situation that comes up often is one that you want to explore a lot so that you have it fully ingrained, fully understood, and you know exactly how to react when that spot comes up in the future. So remember, keep working on it. It will become ingrained over time. It will become usable in real time, and it's going to pay huge dividends when you do this kind of work off table. So I'll see you back soon for part four. We'll wrap this hand up, and yes, the river is an ace, and yes, we're going to talk about exactly what we want to be doing on that card. So I'll see you back soon for that, and of course, in the meantime, good luck out there, and happy grinding.